Hey, how have we gone 10 years without ever talking about Spider-Man? My number one childhood hero, the star of at least four of my favourite films, here's a dude who swings in and out of the relevancy of my life. Recently, for work-related reasons, I had to ingest a lot of Spider-Man media. I know, what a crazy adult sentence that is to say. I played the PlayStation title. You knew. I watched the cartoon. I watched the fa this fan film from the 19... from the 90s? We're not going to talk about that. I thought I'd go back to one of my childhood comics, and why a small arc in a long run really, really spoke to me. This is The Amazing Spider-Man Coming Home by J. Michael Straczynski and John Romita Jr. The very first story arc of the new century. This Spider-Man was a late career Peter Parker, something I've always adored in superhero fiction. A character who's already been beaten black and blue, who's already had all of their core canon events happen to them. Getting Peter Parker out of high school is the best way to force character development, to see what he's done with all of these life-changing questions and what answers he's come to. But what Michael Straczynski did is put him back in school. Mr. Parker, now a teacher, returns to his old school. This version of Spider-Man is in constant conversation with its Golden Age, Silver Age, I never really learned the difference between those two eras. The origin, the regrets, we can just get up and go. But across the, say, next 30 issues, turns out that this New York is not the Silver Age New York of yesteryear. This is not a comic book New York. You could be forgiven for mistaking it for Daredevil. Peter Parker is helping his jaded community by helping homeless kids and lost addicts. And yes, you're right, I said turn of the century. This Spider-Man comic is the one that has to deal with 9-11. What a fallout, tonally. I mean, for the future of the genre. There are some things that can't be forgiven. Jesus, Spider-Man. Everything changes from here. Pure unadulterated propaganda, but still very powerful stuff. This issue even came up in a university lecture once. But the core spirit of Spider-Man refuses to yield to an unforgiving turn of the millennium, Spider-Man stays Spider-Man. And who's Spider-Man? Well, he's the most self-deprecating, doomed, smiling in the face of trauma, and eager to self-develop character in all of fiction. And whilst you might see the Raimi movies at the same time go for, hey, you mess with one of us, you mess with all of us, New York spirit. This comic is not waving the American flag. Uh, it's, it actually just doubles down on the cynicism and postmodernism of a comic book New York we can never return to. Super bleak, but not actually all that edgy. This should be a real low point for the character. Gwen Stacy is dead, Mary Jane has left him forever. But this Peter has a mortgage. He doesn't allow himself the dark, brooding era that his other counterparts would have succumbed to. Peter Parker doesn't let the terrorists win. Peter Parker is just evolving. It's a beautiful little meta comment that the comic tells Peter Parker to his face, evolve or die, you know? Turns out the writers mean literally. <laughs> As this arc introduces Ezekiel, a man who knows Peter's identity, has similar powers, but doesn't seem to be a hero or a villain, telling him Peter is wasting his talents, and he's misunderstood the core basics of why he has these powers. Turns out Peter Parker doesn't even know what genre he was in. This is because coming home brings in a mythical element. Something that's never really been attempted before in his world of science villains and sci-fi battles. You have to reconsider how you've looked at your life. Who and what you are bridges the gap between spider and man. But you're not the first. There are totemistic powers that go back to the dawn of time. Their presence remains with us almost like a race memory. Ask a shaman or an Egyptian priest Ask Eve when the snake spoke to her and offered her a great deal on produce. We tell stories, put on masks, build statues, and say prayers to a memory. The memory that once, when the world was new, great forces walked the earth. Forces that bridge the gap between humans and other species. Spider-Man is a mythical ritual. Immediately, I have the image of a college professor telling me how superheroes are the next Greek gods. They're a modern day pantheon, and I'm like, yeah, no, I got it. We knew this since we were 10. Vultures and crocodiles, scorpions and cobras, jackals and cats and foxes and octopi. 
There are just characters in the Marvel world who are guided by urges and events outside of their control, who feel the unconscious need to turn themselves into dinosaurs, or take on a Wolverine theme, or don a rhino costume. Give Spider-Man another motivation, going even further back that he was not privy to at all. The animal theme is now its whole own category in the Marvel comics. I adore animal totems, I think they're the coolest thing Marvel has. And might be why this verse is full of furries. Peter suddenly realises his entire superhero career has been little more than a distraction. A character got displaced out of his own plots, and now his true foretold final enemy is coming for him in a couple days time. <laughs> In comes Morlan. Morlan's my favourite Spider-Man party. A relentless energy vampire who just doesn't stop coming, hits like a truck, and can't even be quipped at. Spider-Man takes a beating like he's never received before. Whilst Peter Parker's been wasting his time with green goblins and big wheels, here stands a character who genuinely seems like he's a villain from another series, making Spider-Man's villains gallery look like nothing, mocking the series status quo. Morlan was originally intended to be the villain of Across the Spider-Verse, but my god, I think they had to swap him out, because he would sweep that movie in 10 seconds flat. Poor Miles, get my boy out of there. This is the most painful beatdown I think I've ever seen a superhero endure. Strakinsky takes the final boss villain and throws him at Peter first, because in fairness, the rest of the comic is going to be more into personal character stuff. Take this comic, just a few issues after. In the wake of the Morlan fight, Aunt May finds Peter Parker unconscious in the Spider-Man suit. And this is why this is Spider-Man's best run. Aunt May isn't expected to just get over it. She isn't an afterthought. There is an entire issue dedicated to the conversation. No fights, no cityscapes, just two adults in an apartment. And oh my word. It's quiet, it's measured, but it's brutal. I find that comic book fans hate these moments in comics. The girlfriend who can't get over the superhero's double life. You lied to me, you didn't tell me your true identity. Put those words into the mouth of someone as mature and kind as this Aunt May, and it reveals Spider-Man's origin story for what it is. A matter of insecurity and miscommunication and a lack of trust, as Aunt May says. She's seen the love of her life die, and been at the heart of really traumatic experiences. She's not going to fall apart like glass once she realises that he's Spider-Man. And then you're forced to reflect deeper, why did Peter do any of this in the first place? A perceived responsibility from his late uncle? I missed the part where that's my problem. But also, come on, we all know it, guilt. Peter Parker is Spider-Man out of guilt for letting that guy get away. He blames himself for the death of Uncle Ben. Well, get this, so does Aunt May. Aunt May blames herself that day for starting a fight and getting him to go to get groceries. <sighs> Jesus. Her initial horrified reaction isn't, my nephew is Spider-Man and he lied to me. You're in trouble, young man. It's, oh my God, my foster son thinks he's responsible for this horrific tragedy that happened 12 years ago. And they've just both been keeping the secret from one another. Sorry, classic Spider-Man. Tear up the comics. Being Spider-Man was not a therapeutic solution. It was a symptom of guilt. All of this could have been so easily avoided. I was just a kid. Too ashamed to share any of this. And this is why men need to talk about their feelings. Otherwise they end up becoming Spider-Man. It's a whole thing. The happy Spider-Man status quo is built on secrets and misunderstandings. My god, there's stuff in here that I never expected as a Spider-Man fan to get put to bed. It's stuff we never realised drama-wise needed to get put to bed, but once it's pointed out to you it's painfully apparent, and you can't really look at this old, old story the same way ever again no matter how many times they reimagine it. It's thanks to this comic that Spider-Man finally got the dimension he's always deserved and all of the crazy events and issues that came before and after it. Oof. I think it made me realise that these childhood icons, you can do really, really meaty stuff with them. And maybe that sentiment has followed me into adulthood and got me making videos on the internet. I don't know. With great power comes 
great character work, I guess. I'm gonna put the web in web series.